things. So, Peter, over to you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm uh, Pete Carney from Digital Catapult. There's another name that you see there, Michael Satton. He's going to be presenting the, the second half of this presentation. Um, so we were going to call this um, going hotter and faster than 5G, but the problem is that the Catapult has another program associated with 5G, and the 5G lead technologist is bigger and stronger than I am, and I think he would be sad. So we, we stuck with this, but it's, it's definitely an amazing technology. I'm going to spend two minutes talking about the Catapult, and then more time talking about some of the things we've done with, with the Things Network and, and LP1 and, uh, and LoRaWAN particularly. So has anyone heard of the Catapult before? Okay, a few. So my few slides will be slightly wasted, but the idea of the Catapult is we accelerate the early adoption of advanced digital technologies in the UK. So basically helping companies take some of this amazing tech which is coming out, make, making users aware of it, helping developers understand what they can do with it, and generally having a bit of fun with it as well. So um, we focus on, on four areas as the Catapult. We look at um, future networks, which is what LoRaWAN 5G sits under. So that's all around sort of telecommunications, Internet of Things, um, running machines in remote locations either a long, long way away or using lots of bandwidth. We also um, look at immersive technologies. We have a, a whole sector dedicated to that, artificial intelligence, and the, the other nice one, which is future focus. So future focus is anything which crops up which is very interesting, which we might want to do, we stick it under that, under that bucket. But, but those are the, 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 main, the first three are the main three that we, we look at. Um, as the Catapult, um, we focus on, on two sectors. So we're, we're part funded by Innovate UK, which means that we are supposed to help parts of UK industry where they can do better or they, they can grow significantly. And we figure that the creative industry, which clearly aligns more closely with things like the VR and AR stuff, and then manufacturing is the other one, which of course is more closely aligned to, to future networks. Um, we run a whole series of programs, activities, um, environments that you can use. So um, the uh, machine intelligence garage is access to cloud compute that, that SMEs wanting to play around with our advanced algorithms can use. Uh, we've got a um, reality capture studio, which is in Wimbledon. That's the, I think there's only two in the world. And, uh, and there's one in the US and there's one in Wimbledon that, that we are, are partnered with. And that allows you to capture assets to drop into VR experiences. I think it's got like 150, HD video captured um, the cameras which can stitch together. The best one, of course, the Future Networks Lab. It's in our, it's in our, London, in, uh, in our London office opposite the British Library. Um, so that's a place where people can exhibit, uh, gain insights, play with technologies. If you like, you have some money you can sponsor us too. Um, we have an immersive lab in London and also a 5G test bed in Brighton. But enough about that, enough about us. How about some more about you know, things, things that you can do? So we're trying to help UK manufacturing go a bit faster. And I'm going to talk to you about one of the projects we're doing, and Michael's doing, doing the second one. So um, this, is, this, this, brown, this brown splodge here is the Kalahari Desert. Um, it extends uh, almost a, a million square kilometers in, in, in space. It occupies um, almost all of Botswana, eastern third of Namibia, um, and, and north, north, uh, northern part of uh, the Northern Cape in South Africa. Um, so it's a fairly significant piece of land. Uh, it's a desert, hence the name Kalahari Desert. In the, in the daytime, the temperature reaches 45 degrees centigrade. Dry season is about eight months or so. There's a wet, wet season of a month. It can rain um, almost a half a meter. Um, and at night, of course, temperatures plummet. Um, and of course, it's, it's windy and dusty because it's a, a desert. So when, as the land heats up in the daytime, you get all sorts of climatic conditions. You get winds that sweep one way or another, quite changeable. You can get winds up to sort of 40 miles an hour, quite, quite common. It's the home of lots of migratory birds. Um, there are elephants and giraffes roam across the, the space. Predators such as lions, tigers. The riverbeds are grazing spots, so lots of animals come down to the the riverbeds, and of course, there's, there's always famous, famous meerkats that are out there, although they typically don't speak Russian. It's a very different place to England's green and pleasant land. This is a, a nice picture of somewhere in the UK. It's kind of rainy, as it is today, but very green, full of amazing things, amazing things to see, amazing people, amazing engineers. And, uh, and um, it's very different from the Kalahari, but this particular month, so the month of October, um, the Kalahari is going to be transformed a little bit. 
And there are a number of engineers, software guys, camera crews, uh, surveyors, a very important driver, um, who will be heading out there um, to do something rather special. So they're going to be taking out with them a bunch of kit, a bunch of hardware, a particular car, and also, um, as it turns out, some, some Kerlink uh, LoRaWAN base stations and some sensors. So this chap here is a guy called, called Andy Green. And uh, he is aiming to become the fastest person on Earth um, with a car that will go 1,000 miles an hour. That won't happen this year. That'll be next year. But they're testing the car. And I have to say, they're still building the car. So it really is a, the first high-speed test. There's a good probability that things will break. Um, but we're going to try and help them in a certain way to, to make sure that's, that they, they get the most out of the opportunities they have there. So um, the company behind uh, the car, which is called the Bloodhound, um, is a company called Grafton LSR. It's based in Gloucester. It happens to be right next to a nuclear reactor. And, uh, this year's nuclear reactor. There's also a school there as well. I always kind of wonder what the parents thought, you know, whether they worry about a few antenna masts, but there's like a nuclear power station next to their kids' school. But it's a good, it's a good industrial site. Um, and they basically designed from scratch, from first principles, this car. Um, and have built it by hand. Uh, 50 engineers are working on it as we speak. And as I said, they're, they're trying to uh, break the, the speed record, which is currently, I think, it's about 760. I believe the driver is, ha holds the current record. It's, it stood for about 20 years or so. But he's going to go 1,000 miles an hour. So for the, for the Europeans in the audience, that's really fast. So okay. 1,400 or something, 1,600 kilometers. Um, it's an amazing vehicle, um, so the, engine, the, the, the main engine, if you like, which gets to a mere 600 miles an hour, is a prototype Euro, Eurojet um, fighter jet engine. It's coupled to a bespoke rocket engine made by a company called Namo. Um, it produces 212 kilonewtons of thrust, which I guess is quite a lot. Um, and so they're going to beat the, the speed record set over 20 years ago um, by going 1,000 miles an hour. So they've chosen um, South Africa, this place called the Hackskeen Hack Pan, because it's really flat. The, the surface drops only 30 centimeters over the 16-kilometer track. Um, it's, um, they had surveyors out there who were surveying the track with lasers to make sure that within, I think, they, they know every, every meter they've got an accuracy of one millimeter worth of you know, height profiles. So they, they kind of know how flat it is. It's an amazing. Um, if, you know, it's an amazing place to, to try and run this thing. It's really flat. It's got a soft, dry, muddy surface. So typically, whenever you hear about land speed records, you think about um, salt flats, you know, so crisp, crystallized salt. But that's not always suitable because, of course, it vibrates the hell out of the car and the suspension. It really hammers the suspension. So they've decided to, um, to go for this particular uh, flat, which is soft mud. So it's kind of sandy mud. So the car will sort of dig into it as it goes along. Um, maybe the, 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 the wheels will leave a tread of about three or four centimeters of depth. So it's really important they don't run over their own tracks for each run. They have to separate. So the, the track is, I think, 500 meters wide, 16 kilometers, sorry, 500 meters wide, 600, uh, 16 kilometers long, and they'll go back and forth along it. Um, the 21 million square meters of desert have been cleared by hand by these people. So they're really, they're really proud and pleased that, the, that some, uh, an engineering feat is going to be attempted in their back garden. Um, some interesting stats about the car. Um, so the wheels are made out of solid aluminium. They're uh, 75 kilograms each. They have no tires because the tire would fly off as the, as the wheel spins. The, the wheel will spin at 10,000 RPM, not the engine. This is the wheel spinning, which is twice as fast as most car engines rotate. Um, the inside of the um, jet engine runs at 3,000 degrees, which is twice as hot as a volcano, apparently. A uh, car weighs 6.4 tons. And the thing I like most about this is the, the fuel pump for the, for the rocket engine is powered by a Jaguar V8 engine, just the fuel pump. And it burns something like 300 liters of fuel per second when it's going at full whack, which is quite something. Hopefully, there's not too many environmentalists going to watch. But you know, it's only for a few seconds, so it's, you know, it's for a good cause. Um, but it's windy. It's really windy there. You know, they have uh, gusts of up to 40 miles an hour. So obviously, if you're trying to get to the world speed record, you definitely don't want to run into the wind at that speed because you'll lose 40 miles an hour of, of speed. Um, you'd want to go with, this, with the wind. But more importantly, the crosswinds are important because when the car's going at full pelt, the wheels don't really steer the car. It's the, the wind flowing over the bodywork which makes it turn. And as I said, it's really important they don't run over their own tracks and they're going to want to keep on a, an even keel. So it's very important to know 
quite what the climate's doing, or what the microclimate's doing there. So the challenge is to measure wind speed, wind speed and direction, that's important. Temperature, humidity, and pressure are important for optimizing the jet engine performance. Along 70 mile uh, track, um, one sensor every kilometer or mile or so. Um, they want a, a solar powered solution because they've got one base camp somewhere and then they're going to need um, gateways that are distributed along the track, need to run off the sun because they can't plug it into anything. And, uh, and some sort of near real time display of data. As it turns out, the Catapult, the company I work for, um, we have built a sort of a, a platform which does some of those things. We built it for the Royal Air Force and for the Navy and for a company called NSG that Michael will talk about later. And it was essentially um, a sensor solution to understand the state of certain assets that the, the military had. So you're probably all thinking of weapons. Actually, it wasn't. It was slightly more mundane. It was you know, blood products, medical supplies, stocks. They, they lose. They, they have the potential to lose a huge amount of stuff for the military. They're, they're moving all sorts of bits and pieces all over the world. So they want to know where it is, where it's been. Has it been shocked? Has it been dropped? Has it got too hot? Has it got too cold? So we built this platform, which we call WASP, which stands for Wide Area Sensor Platform, which is essentially sensors, a network, TTM-based network, and then a dashboard. But it was actually missing a couple of components. So what it had never done was measured wind speed, because the, um, the MOD had never asked us to do that. So we, um, I went to, so we had this sort of chance meeting with the, the team at Bloodhound, and they were actually um, trying to get additional funding and announcing their, their, their trip um, out to South Africa. And they, they did it at our center, and I went up and I spoke to the guy, and I said, hey, you know, um, do you want to, we could probably help you with some wind speed. Is that something you're interested in? They said, yeah, absolutely. We totally want to know about wind speed. But we, we, tried, we tried a few years ago. We couldn't get the equipment to work, and, you know, we don't know what to do. So would you help us? So we said, sure. So I went down to my our CEO. Um, a guy called Jeremy, and I said, you know, there's an opportunity. It's not going to make any money because they haven't got any money. Bloodhound haven't got any money either. Um, we, they're not going to pay for this, but can we, you know, it's kind of prestigious to get involved with this sort of thing. World record attempt. It's amazing. And he said, absolutely, Peter, you can dedicate some resource to upgrade the platform, but you can't spend any money, unfortunately. You can't spend any real cash because we're non for profit and all that sort of thing and state aid. So we had to find some additional funding. So we found um, one of our friends, AWS, who um, our, most of our platforms tend to be built on AWS, and said, um, we're probably going to need some cash to buy some additional sensors. Could you, could you give us 20,000 pounds? And they kind of said yes, which was rather nice of them. So we had to then go off and find some, some sensors to, to meet this wind speed thing. Now, of course, as I mentioned, it's, it's dusty, so dust gets stuck in things. It's hot. Um, and ideally, you want sensors that haven't got any, any sort of moving parts. So we, um, we needed something that was able to, you know, survive a, a desert condition. It's got to have good six-month battery life. You know, everything that's LoRaWAN is at least a year, isn't it, as, as we know. So um, sensors, uh, th every three minutes, they wanted a measurement, no moving parts, and it's got to be moisture resistant as well. Um, so we, we did an extensive search of the internet and, and focused on um, this, this company called Decent Lab, who built this amazing wind speed sensor. They're about £1,000 each for the entry level one. Um, they have a full weather station, very clever stuff, no moving parts. It actually listens to the wind to calculate the speed of it. Um, it's not quite like that, but essentially as the wind blows in over these little knobbly things, there's a pad in the middle and there's an ultrasonic sound which is squirting down. As the wind blows over the sensor, I think it shifts the wave. So it's, I think something to do a Doppler, Doppler shift, and it can calculate the direction and speed to some amazing levels of accuracy. Um, this sensor will also give you um, temperature, and their, their kind of fully fledged one will also give them, uh, give you, you know, a rainfall, lightning strikes, sound, all sorts of bits and pieces. Um, what we loved about this device, they, they very kindly sent us a, a free sample. I mean, to, to, to play around with, we have to send it back. But it was a, a really, really kind of them since there was no guarantee we were going to do this project. And, um, and essentially, uh, it was amazing. We, out of the box, configured on the TTN back end, it came straight up instant, instantly. It was really good product. So if you want a sort of Rolls Royce of, uh, of wind speed sensors, this is one that's worth looking at. Um, for the other sensors, so things like shock, humidity, barometric pressure, we quite like these Ciconia sensors. They, they've got a very, very small, they have a battery life of a year or so, depending on how you program them. You know, it's got a good set of things that you can measure in there out of the box. It's got a good program store and program memory, so you can write some quite sophisticated compute to uh, 
send messages at the right time, store things, fail over if you like. Um, it's also got a magnetometer and a gyroscope, which we don't particularly use for this, for this project. Um, the way that we've, we've written some code to go into the Sikonia, so it basically attempts to join a network, and, and if, it, if it has joined the network, it will send data every three to 15 minutes. Um, it's, if it can't find the network, it'll store up to 14 days worth of, of samples. This is just something we programmed onto it. You could probably extend that further. Um, and then as it find, when it finds the network, it will gradually unload, and it keeps a, a track of the time and the sequence. So you, you might not know precisely where something was when it was shocked or dropped or hit or overheated, but you would know from a time perspective where. So if you are shipping something across the sea and you drop this into a container, when it's out of coverage, um, it's, you'll get all the events that that container's been through when it comes to offload the data when it arrives somewhere. Um, it's also programmed so, so that shock, shock events and threshold breaches, so you can say, if it's above 20 degrees, I want you to send an alert now. That'll immediately send an alert, and it will bypass anything in the queue, so you get the, the shock, shock alert straight away. And that's a wonderful diagram that shows how it works, if you can see that. And uh, it, it's programmed over NFC, so you just plonk it on an NFC pad, and it will program itself. And it's, it's again, a good device. Um, we are... We like lots of gateways, but we tend, to have, we tend to have quite a few of these. The curling gateways, 49 LoRa demodulates over nine channels. It's got 2G, 3G, and Ethernet backhaul, so it's kind of really good for this sort of thing. In the case of the desert, we're going to be putting some 3G SIM cards in them, and there's a, believe it or not, there's coverage out there. And it's also got a GPS receiver as well. But we're not, in fact, using um, that too much. We're not trying to locate where the car is. I think they're going to know where the car is. This is just to, um, to know the environmental conditions. So we don't need to use any of the sort of rather clever um, triangulation stuff that it can do. In terms of the power supply, we kind of, I know we can buy some, and we, we, we just didn't have time, so we thought we'd just quickly build a, a solar power, solar powered um, charger for it. So we've got a solar pan, panel 120 watts, which drives a car battery. Um, it'll run off the car battery for about 10 days or so, um, and then, but if there's sunlight, it'll, it'll run forever, is the plan. Um, and it's, this is really important. If you ever use the Curlink base station or gateways, you should, and you're going to run off the battery, buy one of these things. They're really good. It's called a battery guard. So when I, um, when I configured these gateways, I, I had them running off batteries in my garden for 10 days before we shipped them, just to see if it would actually work. And, um, and after about 10 days or so, um, the gateways didn't work. I thought, OK, well, the battery's flat. I'll charge it up again. Charged the battery up, didn't connect to the TTN, didn't connect to our VPN, nothing happened at all. It's like, OK, what's happened here? Let's try the second one. Same problem, completely busted. Third one, completely busted. So what happened? So I sort of logged on and got Mark over there to log on for me as well. And basically, the, the gateways had, had reset to their factory conditions, their factory states. And it's like, why has this happened? Because the battery went flat. And it turns out that one of the ways of resetting the Curlink base stations or gateways is to press the reset button 22 times. If you do that, while it's booting up, if you press reset, wait a few seconds, press reset, 20, that's how you reset it back to its factory mode. Why there wasn't a little pin saying reset to factory, I don't know. And it turns out that when, when the battery's on its, on its last legs, the gateway starts up, gets halfway through the boot sequence, the radios come on, the 3G comes on, then it the battery level drops, it restarts. And it restarted the thing 22 times, which, which, which knackered them, which isn't so good. I mean, it didn't knacker them, it just means they need to be reconfigured, which isn't so great if you've got these things deployed out in the field and you can't get to them ever again. So if you buy one of those things, you can set it up such that if the battery level drops below 10 volts, it just kills it. And then you have to, you have to go and you know, charge the battery up first. So definitely worthwhile. Lessons learned. Um, TTN, um, they've set up a, a private backend server for us. Um, it's the sort of classic hosted solution. So we've got a private instance running, uh, which these three or, three or four gateways are connected to. Um, in terms of the, the front end, um, it's basically all running on AWS infrastructure. It's a Node.js based, based front end, um, integrated with the, the TTN APIs, so it pulls all the data through, uh, and a Postgres database. So a sort of classic architecture that you'd expect. And this is what a dashboard looks, dashboard looks like. So each of the, of the rows, so you can see on the left-hand side, Ciconia 1, Ciconia 2. So each of those is a sensor. You get the, the various things you're trying to measure. So you can see the temperature. I think the next one is shock. The next one's pressure and then humidity. 
And if anything, if any of those thresholds is breached, they go red. On the right-hand side, you can see um, a graph of the historical data, and you can, of course, download all the data to post-process if you want as a CSV file. So it's simple, but it's actually just all they need. So as, as Vinky was saying, ask the customer what they want, give them what they want. Uh, we didn't massively over-engineer it. It does exactly what they need. So if the, if the wind is gusting, they can go and, go and decide to run the car or not, or slow it down, or delay a pit stop, whatever it might be. Uh, to test it, um, this is me set up in my, uh, well, not in my garden, in a field next to someone's garden. Um, set up all these sensors on, on bits, of, uh, bits of pole from Screwfix. Um, had my son help. He's 11 years old. He always likes to get involved, so he was there configuring the base station. So got the two, two gateways in the back, curling ones on tripods with a battery underneath. Um, and, and there's a dashboard, and it, and it all just worked out of the box. You switch it on. Two minutes later, it's acquired the network. It's connected, sending data. Um, this is us delivering um, the kit to, to the Bloodhound team. Um, so that's the, uh, he's a guy called Josh on the right-hand side. He's the kind of DevOps person. He makes things work, make, makes the communications work, both in terms of their base camp in the desert, but also the comms on the car. I think it's got seven computers, all running with different protocols. You know, you obviously have a, an engine management system for a Eurofighter engine on one side, and then you've got you know, the in-car entertainment system from Blaupunkt on the other. It's got to talk to each other. I'm not sure if that, that's true. Um, and then um, this is a rather nice picture of the steering wheel. Um, it's actually printed out of, out of titanium. It's, it's 3D printed titanium steering wheel. And I said to one of the engineers, you know, why did you build a steering wheel out of titanium? You know, surely you'd want a bit of soft rubber in front of you in case things don't work out as planned. And he said, because we can. So there's a nice answer. So I um, just wanted to say that, you know, we all hope that they succeed. They are, um, they're running the car, I think it's going to start in a couple of weeks or so. Um, so we will see um, some telemetry come back from the system. If all works well and they get the car up to 600 miles an hour, then the plan is for next year to go back and go for the 1,000-mile record. But it's very exciting, and we're going to watch them. And no doubt we'll be organizing some events in our catapult center when they start to do things. The test runs will run over a period of about three or four weeks, so we can't say on a particular day. But if there's something interesting which we can share with you, we'll post it on the website, invite people down, and this sort of thing. So wishing them the best of luck. I'm going to hand over to Michael next, who should be ready. But before I do that, I've been asked for two very quick, important announcements. So first of all, we've got this rather good IoT hardware from prototype to production guide on our stand. If you'd like to know about some of the things to look out for if you're building hardware, for some of the pitfalls or some of the opportunities, grab a copy of this. So we have a stand in the main hall, it's digital catapult. And also, we're looking to hire a, a, an IoT technologist. So if, if you would like to apply, or if you know anyone, please come and talk to us. Huh? Okay, we can't interview them now, sadly not. Well, my, maybe uh, Alex can. But uh, come to our stand and, and make yourself known. Michael. Thank you very much. So uh, I will tell you about now how we, we're getting hotter. Uh, I'll try to go fast. So whenever uh, we think about manufacturing, uh, there are things that are, uh, of course, hot whenever you have a furnace. And usually you have some form of insulation around them and you want to detect uh, when this insulation is thinning or cracking. So um, the idea that the challenge that we had was to build a solution uh, using, of course, uh, LP1, because that's what we do uh, every day. So uh, that was the objective. And usually the way it's done today is people have a typical IR FLIR camera, and you have uh, uh, wireless cameras that cost about 10,000 pounds. And when you ask the IT person in a factory to connect that to Wi-Fi, they say, excuse me, what did you just ask? And so, of course, uh, there's no way that people can actually build this uh, enterprise Y and connect that to their other uh, enterprise systems. So the challenge was to build something wireless uh, that, would, that could be deployed and would cost a bit less than that. So these were the requirements. We needed to measure up to 1,000 degrees. Uh, it's working up to uh, 60 centigrade uh, on a constant basis, so it's a bit hotter than the, uh, the desert, which is 45. 
needed to have a battery lifetime of six months and uh, cost less than 150 pounds for each unit. So that was quite a challenge, but we're always up to it. We looked at what was on the market, and we, uh, there are definitely some uh, thermal images uh, that do already have LoRaWAN, or you can uh, actually use these, which are made by a, a French company called Terabi, and they make them with uh, various interfaces. The problem is that uh, um, uh, we didn't know, we couldn't reprogram them to our own purposes, and also uh, we, did, we were not sure that of the battery lifetime because these are fairly small, so they didn't fit all the requirements. And also in terms of, of price, uh, this is not something that was uh, doable. So we developed uh, our own for our end customer uh, with a thermal pile that can go up to a, a, a thousand centigrade. Um, in terms of uh, image size, we transmit an image every six hours. So for this phase of the project, we are limited to uh, 32 by 32 pixels, but there's nothing that prevents you from having uh, higher definition images, which are 80 by 64 pixels, and it's powered by a, a AA battery. And to test whether it would last uh, uh, in working conditions, we bought a little sterilizing uh, container that is usually used uh, at your dentist, and we ran it at 70 degrees. Uh, for a week, and the battery seemed okay. So that was before deploying. And uh, we optimized the, uh, it's based on an STM32 uh, microcontroller. And in deep sleep, uh, because of course the, the imager spends most of its time in deep sleep, uh, we consume 14 microamps. And then we take that, we send it to TTN Industries instance, and we have the same dashboard that Peter just showed you. So the system components, I'm not gonna go into details, but they are really simple. And instead of using a, um, a more expensive WearNet station, uh, we just use a, a basic indoor gateway, which costs about 250 pounds. So it's really about low cost. Uh, to develop, the, we had a, a few challenges, uh, not just testing, uh, but we also had to do things in steps. So first we validated the I2C communications because uh, even though it's supposed to be standard, there are different flavors of I2C. Um, we had to, of course, verify uh, LoRaWAN communication through the site, making sure that uh, uh, when you're on an industrial site, uh, you, do, you can get communication uh, even if the distance between uh, the gateway and the sensor is 300 meters, but you have a lot of metal and a lot of, of course, uh, uh, bricks in between. Um, when we were performing calibration checks, one of the issues is that uh, uh, they wouldn't let us heat up the catapult to more than 60 degrees, so uh, we had to use uh, we came up with uh, using a soldering iron, and uh, so we had to adjust the emissivity because, of course, refractory bricks have an emissivity of about 0.9, and uh, soldering iron uh, has a very different emissivity. Uh, and then because we had to make uh, 10 devices, we had to make sure that they were each uh, within 1% uh, uh, of each other. And here are the results. So uh, the casing is made of uh, ABS and, and nylon, and the electronics are in this little black box, and then we just have uh, wires for the, the taking power to the, the sensor, the thermopile, and for the I2C communication. And because it's this uh, uh, locking system, you can really point the camera to wherever you want it to, whatever you want it to look at. Signal coverage uh, was amazingly good, uh, even though we had to, we had sensors on the other side of a furnace that was fairly high, and with three layers of bricks on each side, uh, we still could get uh, fairly good 
signal. And even from underneath the furnace, uh, you still can get communication. So with just one gateway, which costs 250 pounds, and we can cover the entire uh, industrial site. So the lessons learned uh, was that, uh, first of all, uh, TTN is great not just to do proof of concept, because at first we had just one sensor, but then when we switched to the uh, actual deployment, we used TTN Industries, and it, it's working flawlessly. Um, sensor calibration is always tricky when you're not at a customer site and you have to reproduce industrial conditions. Uh, it is uh, very difficult, even if it's not in terms of physical dimensions, but also in terms of communication. It's hard to reproduce exactly the same uh, links, communication links, and to do uh, battery lifetime measurements, it is kind of tricky. Um, what we learned also is that uh, even though our little LoRaWAN radio can operate at 60 degrees. When we're doing measurements, the laptops don't like to be, to be held at 60 degrees for very long. So every 10 minutes, we had to get out, let the laptop uh, cool, and the battery of the laptop would conk after about 20 minutes. So it was a lengthy test. And, uh, and that's it. So, um, you know, what I think the message is, is that uh, we can go hotter and, and faster, but we can also be thriftier because it is possible to do industrial grade solutions that do provide very important information to manufacturers, but are low cost. And uh, hopefully next year we'll go even further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Peter and Michael.